Welcome to the Ataxia Educational Series from Johns Hopkins. I'm Elizabeth Tracy. And I'm Dr. Liana Rosenthal, the director of the Ataxia Center. I'm going to call you Liana. Is that okay? Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining me today. I think I'd like to start first with this bit of medical ease, if you will. Ataxia, a term that I bet many people don't understand. Yes, yeah, so ataxia is an incoordination of our movements. So what this means is if people have trouble with walking, they have trouble with sometimes with swallowing or even with speech, they have trouble going to grab something because it's all about coordinating our movements. And you can have this discoordination, this incoordination from a number of different reasons and a number of different problems in the brain and in the, over the entire body actually. Of course, we have all these different parts of our brains. Is there a specific part of the brain that's involved in most cases of ataxia? So ataxia can actually be caused from three different main areas. So the first main area is the vestibular system, which is basically our inner ears. The second main area is the cerebellum, which is this part of the brain that's sort of right in the back and kind of tucked under the cortex, the big part of the brain. And then the third area in the body is actually the sensory system, so for people who have sensory ataxia, it oftentimes means they have trouble feeling their feet. And if you can't feel your feet, you have trouble walking. So you can get ataxia from all three, from problems in all three of those different areas. And a lot of times people who have cerebellar ataxia may also have a little bit of problems in their sensory system or even in their vestibular system. At the ataxia center, we focus on people who have problems for, who have ataxia due to problems in their cerebellum, that part of the brain back there. Before we describe a little bit more about that, what are the relative frequencies of these three different types of ataxia? So it's actually difficult to put our finger on that because ataxia can be caused by so many different things. One of the things that, that can cause the cerebellar ataxia are actually genetic problems, so it can be familial. For that, the about one to five people per 100,000 have genetic ataxia. By comparison, they say Parkinson's disease is about 13 per 100,000. So these are really rare diseases. The challenge with getting a number on ataxia is all of those different causes. So people who have diabetes, for example, may lose some feeling in their feet and therefore have some mild sensory ataxia. Nobody's really counting those folks. So it's difficult to get a really good number, but we have good numbers on the genetics, and that was the number that I told you. So then would you say that most cases of ataxia are because of problems in the cerebellum? Most cases of ataxia are probably not due to causes of, in the cerebellum. That's what we focus on in the Hopkins Ataxia Center, in part because we believe we have the expertise and the specialty to do so. But I would say more often, people are off balance due to other problems, because that's what patients usually come to us for, is balance issues. And you can have balance issues from a whole host of problems. And it's our job in the Ataxia Center and your doctor's job at home to try to help figure out why are you having these balance problems? Why are you having these speech problems? Is it due to the cerebellum? And if so, we have the expertise to help you. Okay, so then let's explore this issue of cerebellar ataxia mm -hmm. a little bit more. Okay. How do you find out that that's what the problem is? So there's a couple of different ways. The main way is there's some clues on history that are really oftentimes classically cerebellar. And then there are also some things on exam that are classic cerebellar. And then finally, there are some imaging findings that we can look at. And if you like, I can run through each of those. That would be great. So in history, some of the things that I find are really classic is patients who describe lying down and looking up. So the people who are bench pressing. So you lie down and you're looking up at the bar, and that can be really dizzying for people who have cerebellar ataxia. So that's something that's classically cerebellar. Patients who describe a delayed focusing, so you move your head and it takes a moment for the world to come into focus. You should be able to move your eyes and things are gonna focus pretty quickly. But if you move your head and it takes a moment, that's classically cerebellar. So those are some clues, and there's a lot more as well that we look for in terms of the history. On exam, there's a number of different things we look for, and a lot of it has to do with the cerebellum's role in modulating our movements. So 
if I'm going to grab my finger and my brain is telling me to grab my finger, my cerebellum is what makes sure I don't go past my finger or before my finger, but actually hit my finger. And if my finger is moving, my cerebellum is even more important in modulating exactly that I hit the right spot. And so a lot of our exam maneuvers and things that we see are related to testing how well people do with that movement. So we look at people's eye movements and we look to see do they have, when they come back to their center point, do they go past the center point with their eyes or do they hit right on the nose like they're supposed to? We also look at uh, finger chase. So we move their fingers around like this and do they, again, match our finger movements or do they go past it or before it? We also listen to their speech because people with cerebellar ataxia can have some speech problems as well. Um, there's also, and then we look at their walking, of course, as well. Are their gait really wide based? Because if you're off balance, all of us, by, to compensate, we make our feet wider. So you know this, that if you're walking on a really uneven surface, you might put your hands out to kind of keep your balance, and it's all ways of making ourselves bigger to help keep that walking. So those are all many of the things that we look at in the exam, and there's many more as well. And then in terms of the imaging, we look specifically at the cerebellum, and we look at its size, and then we also look for any other things. So some of the different causes of ataxia have some very specific findings on MRI, though those are few and far between. But with the MRI, we can also look to make sure you didn't have a stroke in your cerebellum that's causing these problems and things like that. I love the way that you described these findings that you see on exam. I'm sure that that makes a lot of sense to patients also. That's the hope, and the hope is that we, when we're talking with patients, we're able to, we can find these exam findings and translate to them to patients' experience. So in life, it doesn't matter whether on my exam, you can grab my finger. That doesn't really matter. What matters in life is when you go to grab the glass at the dinner table, do you sometimes knock that over because you're having trouble with sort of modulating your arm movements to get to the right spot? It sounds to me like cerebellar ataxia then is something that somebody develops over life. Is that correct? So the type of cerebellar ataxia that we work with in the ataxia center, that is often but not always the case. So this then points to the idea that you must have to do an awful lot of different kinds of therapeutics in order to help. There are a lot of different therapeutics. So one of the things that we focus on is really looking at all of the different symptoms and how can we address each of those symptoms and how can we improve quality of life. So that's the goal. So with that in mind, we, if they're having walking and balance problems, which most of our patients are, we almost always send them to physical therapy to really work on that core strength and that balance. And then we also really emphasize to patients the importance of exercise on a regular daily basis again, to work on that core strength and that balance, and then also to work on their endurance. Because if, if it takes work to walk from your bedroom to your bathroom to your kitchen, you need to have the endurance to be able to do that increased work all day. Plus, you may want to go to Target and walk around to Target and buy a few things. You need to have the endurance to do all of that because doing all of those things is more work for our patients than it is for folks who don't have ataxia. So this multidisciplinary approach then mm -hmm. is really important. Absolutely, because we also look at the walking and balance. We do our best to address speech issues that, as they come up as well. Swallowing issues are also really critical to address in terms of safety and also in terms of making sure patients are getting adequate nutrition. We also look at things such as their mood, and we also look at their cognition, because there's growing recognition of the role of the cerebellum in terms of mood and cognitive changes. And as these mood and cognitive changes impact patients, they also have a fundamental impact on patients' relationships with their spouses and their kids and their work and all of those things that you could imagine mood and cognition impacting. Are most cases of cerebellar ataxia progressive then? The cases that we focus on in the ataxia center really are the, what we call neurodegenerative, which is to say slowly progressive, getting worse over time, cerebellar ataxia. And we do that in part because we feel like we have the expertise to do our best to address both 
the etiology of their neurodegenerative cerebellar ataxia, so what causes it, and then also do our best to look at all of the different symptoms and problems they're having and figure out what needs to be addressed. What would you say is the outlook for someone who has cerebellar ataxia? It really depends on why they have it. And the frank answer is a lot of times we can't figure out why. I'd say about 50% of our patients, 40 to 50%, have an unknown cerebellar ataxia despite extensive workup. And amongst those patients, it varies. I have some patients who have had cerebellar ataxia for 30 or 40 years, and they walk into clinic, maybe with their walker, but nevertheless, they walk into clinic. I have other patients who, by about 10 years into the disease, are absolutely using walkers and um, motorized scooters even, because they really can't walk very well anymore. And I have other patients who unfortunately have actually died due to complications of some of these cerebellar ataxias. So it's a really wide range depending on why somebody has this. So the research role is really important. The research role is really important, absolutely, in terms of learning more about the different causes. And then we're also doing research on what can we do to help patients now. Because it's great to be able to get the etiology and find out more, but when a patient's sitting in my office, the question is, how can I help you today as well? How can somebody get an appointment? So the main way to get an appointment is through Jana, and she is wonderful, and you give her a call, and you send over all your notes, and I review every single patient that comes into the center. The idea is I really want to focus on these patients with this slowly progressive cerebellar ataxia. So I screen every single patient that comes in in terms of their notes and make sure that I think we can help them in some way, whether by working on their quality of life, whether by figuring out why they're having their symptoms in the first place. And then after that, they are distributed amongst our many physicians, and we also have them see whatever additional folks we think would be helpful. So balance problems, they should see our physical therapist. They're having problems with fine motor movements, they see our occupational therapist. If they're having problems with speech, they see our speech therapist. We have a geneticist on staff as well, and so a lot of our patients will see our geneticists when we talk about genetic testing. And then finally, we have a health educator as well, and she really focuses on outreach and education in order to make the experience of the disease slightly less lonely and also to educate patients about their disease and what they can do to help themselves. And we think both of those are an important piece of the overall multidisciplinary care. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining me. Absolutely. Thank you for having me.